Um, so thanks very much for the invitation. I'm going to be uh, speaking about a continuation of the work that Travis was talking about with Nicola. Um, so just to recap a little bit what uh, Travis was saying in his talk, holonomicity is a kind of non-degeneracy condition for holomorphic Poisson structures, which we introduced a few years ago. And um, the way it works, you start with a holomorphic Poisson manifold, you form this complex, which is the, the polyvectors with this Poisson differential, which computes the Poisson cohomology. Uh, you want to know when it's finite dimensional, so you use the, the theory of D modules. You convert this into a complex of D modules and you look at its uh, singular support in the cotangent bundle. And um, the Poisson manifold is holonomic. The definition is that uh, it's holonomic if this complex of D modules is holonomic. So in other words, the singular support is a Lagrangian. Uh, and uh, as we, uh, as Travis mentioned, this uh, implies that uh, the number of uh, so-called characteristic symplectic leaves of this Poisson manifold, so these were um, certain special symplectic leaves where the, the modular vector field is, is tangent. So if the, if the manifold is holonomic, then the number of characteristic leaves is necessarily finite, and we conjecture that actually um, this is a biconditional statement. So this modular vector field is a kind of divergence of the Poisson tensor. We'll see some examples on the next slide. Uh, but anyway, the motivation, again, is that the polyvector fields with this differential become a perverse sheaf, which uh, essentially makes the deformation theory of the Poisson manifold topological. It's computed as cohomology of certain local systems. So um, what I want to do now is, uh, is basically give a talk about some very concrete examples of these holonomic Poisson manifolds. I'm gonna start with a case just in two dimensions where there's already a little bit of subtlety. And then um, bootstrapping from there, I'm gonna speak about some higher dimensional examples, which are the Hilbert schemes of surfaces. Okay. So um, a Poisson surface for me is a, is a complex analytic surface X, a smooth one, uh, which is equipped with a Poisson bivector. So uh, on a surface, a bivector is just a section of the anti-canonical bundle and the integrability condition for a Poisson structure is vacuous in this dimension. So it's just any section of the anti-canonical line bundle. And uh, so then uh, this section will have some zero locus, the vanishing locus of the Poisson structure, which I'm going to denote by boundary of X um, because it's sort of the boundary of the open symplectic leaf in this uh, surface. And then, uh, th so this will be a curve always because it's the vanishing locus of a section of a holomorphic line bundle, um, but uh, it may be a singular curve. And so I'll denote the singular locus by boundary squared. So the example to keep in mind is uh, to take X as the projective plane and then the anti-canonical line bundle is a line bundle of degree three, which means that any section will vanish on a cubic curve in P2. So the classification of cubic curves is Classical, the smooth ones uh, are elliptic curves. And then there are various singularities which can arise. So you could uh, degenerate a smooth curve to a, an irreducible curve, which has a single node or a cusp, or you could uh, degenerate it further to get uh, multiple irreducible components. And if you degenerate it really far, then you can have a situation, for instance, where you have two, li uh, two lines, one of them taken with multiplicity two, or the most degenerate case would be a, a triple line. Okay, so. Um, as you'll see, I'm color coding things. So the blue locus is the, uh, the open symplectic part of this Poisson manifold. The red locus is the vanishing set of the Poisson tensor. And then the green locus is the singular locus of this curve. Okay. So when you have multiple com uh, components with some higher multiplicity, you can consider that singular. So, um, so the Poisson structure is non-degenerate away from the curve. That's the blue locus. And so locally you can find Darboux coordinates. And then this modular vector field is a kind of divergence of the Poisson tensor. So you get it by differentiating pi. Uh, so you just get zero. In particular, it's tangent to the open symplectic leaf as any vector field must be. Uh, on the other hand, if you look on the smooth locus of the curve, then you can uh, linearize the Poisson structure. So if, uh, if you write the curve as a vanishing set of some coordinate u, then you can arrange so that the bivector is u del u wedge del v. This is a simple example of this log, uh, log symplectic structure that's, that Travis was talking about. Uh, 
So now again, the, the modular vector field is a divergence of the Poisson tensor. So you get it by uh, essentially differentiating the coefficient and contracting it into the, the bivector component. So when you do that, what you get is the vector field del V. Um, so that's, uh, that's exactly a vector field, which is tangent to this uh, red curve. And it's gonna be obviously non-zero at any smooth point of this curve. So uh, the modular vector field is tangent to this curve. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, any vector field which is tangent to a singular curve must actually vanish at the singular points because uh, vector field is a symmetry. So it has to preserve the singular locus, which is a characteristic feature of that, uh, that curve. Um, so what are the characteristic symplectic leaves in this case? Well, it's quite simple. Uh, the open leaf is always characteristic. This vector field is clearly tangent. And then um, the zero dimensional leaves are the points of the curve. And what we've seen is that uh, a point is characteristic, so the vector field vanishes there if and only if it's a singular point of the curve. So the conjecture is that um, uh, holonomicity of the Poisson structure is equivalent to having finitely many characteristic leaves. So in this particular case, it means that uh, you have finitely many singular points of this curve. So in other words, you can't have this situation of a component with uh, higher multiplicity. Uh, okay, so the conjecture is actually a theorem in this dimension. This is true. Uh, Poisson structure on surface is holonomic if and only if the curve is reduced, so the singularities are isolated, uh, which in turn is equivalent to saying that uh, when you invert the bivector, you get a two form which has uh, log poles, so first order poles on this curve. Um, now, there's a complete birational classification of Poisson surfaces, at least in the projective case. Uh, it goes back to the early days of classification of surfaces, Enriquez and Kodaira, and then was refined by Bartocci and Macri and Ingalls in the Poisson setting. Uh, what it says is that if you have a projective Poisson surface, then it's necessarily birationally equivalent to one of the following things. So we have this example of P2 with a cubic curve. That's one of the birational classes. Another obvious way to get a, symplectic, or a Poisson surface is to take a curve and form its cotangent bundle. That's a symplectic surface. It's non-compact, so it's not projective, but you can uh, projectivize it by like, filling in the punctures in the curve and, uh, and then adding a section at infinity to get a P1 bundle. So uh, you, you can take a projective completion of a cotangent bundle. That will give you something. Um, there's some other thing which looks like a product of P1. So you take P1 cross uh, an elliptic curve, C mod a lattice, with a very simple Poisson structure. Um, or you could take a, a two-dimensional complex torus, so C2 mod a lattice, with a constant bivector on C2. That'll give a symplectic structure. And then there's only one other birational class, which is the famous K3 surface. So this is a, these are the uh, compact, uh, simply connected uh, Kähler uh, symplectic surfaces. Okay, now one uh, funny consequence of this birational classification is a statement about what kind of singularities this curve can actually have. Well, it turns out that um, the singularities are always locally quasi-homogeneous, meaning that um, I can find a chart in which uh, this curve is expressed as the zero locus of a quasi-homogeneous polynomial. That's going to be important for us in the next slide, so that's why I brought it up. Okay, so um, we've seen that the characteristic leaves in this surface consist of the open leaf and the singular points. So let me give a name to the inclusions. The J is the open inclusion and I is the closed one. Um, so let me explain then what the cohomology of this surface looks like, the Poisson cohomology. So let's make this assumption that the, the singularities are quasi-homogeneous, which is automatic in the projective case then uh, the cohomology has the following description. So this uh, complex of polyvector fields with the differential, it decomposes it in the derived category as a direct sum of two pieces. So there's uh, one piece, which is the push forward of the constant sheaf on this open symplectic leaf. So this corresponds somehow to the cohomology of the open symplectic leaf. And then there is another component, which is a skyscraper sheaf that's supported at the singular locus. So I take the anti-canonical line bundle and I pull it back to the singular locus, um, but the singular locus has some kind of scheme structure. So this is some kind of uh, skyscraper sheaf whose uh, dimension at a singular point is uh, the dimension of the, the algebra of functions on that singular scheme. Um, so that's the so-called Turina number. 
And uh, what you get is the following description of the Poisson cohomology. So this is a description of the, this complex in the drive category. So when you take hypercohomology, you immediately get a description of the global cohomology, which, uh, which says the following. So if you look at the co Poisson cohomology in degree J, uh, then you just get uh, the ordinary singular cohomology of the open symplectic leaf when J is not equal to two. And then um, when J is equal to two, there's this extra contribution coming from the skyscraper sheath. So in dimension two, in degree two, you get the second cohomology of the open symplectic leaf plus a, a vector space, uh, which is coming from the skyscraper. And the, the interpretation of this in deformation theory is that if you want to deform the Poisson structure, there are two things you can do. You can like imagine keeping the curve fixed and deforming the symplectic form, keeping its polar divisor unchanged. And so that's parameterized by the cohomology class of that symplectic two form in the complement. And then there's also the possibility if you have a singular curve of taking that curve and smoothing it out. And those smoothings are parameterized by this vector space. Um, okay, so uh, let me just quickly sketch how the proof goes. It's quite, uh, quite uh, simple once you see how to put it together. So, um, First of all, what you do is you restrict this complex to the open symplectic leaf. Now there, the Poisson structure is non-degenerate, so the polyvectors are isomorphic to the forms just by, uh, by the contraction with omega. But again, as Travis said, we have the, the Poincaré lemma, which says that the cohomology of the forms is, is trivial locally. So this, uh, this complex is equivalent to the, the constant sheaf sitting in degree zero. So on the open symplectic leaf, everything is simple. And so uh, what it means is that if you have any polyvector, of course, and you can restrict it to the open symplectic leaf and get a form on the open part, but it may have poles. Uh, but in any case, what you get is this uh, kind of a junction map, which takes the complex we're after and uh, maps it to the push forward of this complex from the open leaf. So just uh, essentially restriction of polyvectors. And now the key point is that this, uh, this map uh, splits actually. So there's a map going in the other direction, um, which is obtained in the following way. So uh, the cohomology of the open part of this surface can be computed using the, the cohomology uh, of, of uh, differential forms which have logarithmic poles along this curve. And here we actually have to use the fact that the singularities are quasi homogeneous. So in general, this uh, log to ram complex may not compute the cohomology of the complements, but uh, when the singularities are quasi homogeneous, there's some kind of uh, arguments using a local contracting homotopy to, to show that it works. That was explained in the 90s by these authors. And uh, so the consequence of this is you get a splitting of this map in the derived category, which tells you that why the, the polyvectors decompose as the direct sum of this uh, complex, Rj star of the constant sheaf, plus some other direct sum end. And so then it's just a quick calculation to con convince yourself that the quotient is exactly the skyscraper sheaf. Okay. So that's, uh, that's the idea of the proof. Um, okay, so I want to go on right now to the, the Hilbert schemes. So let's recall what the Hilbert scheme is. You start with a, you start with a surface, say, for us, it's a Poisson surface, and then you can form the, the nth symmetric power, which make, means you take x to the power n, and then you mod out by permutation of the factors. So that's a Poisson variety. It carries a Poisson, you know, x to the n carries a, a Poisson structure, which is invariant under permutation, so it descends to the quotient. But it's a singular variety, and it has this uh, famous resolution of singularities called the Hilbert scheme. So if you think of the symmetric power as, as somehow uh, enumerating uh, collections of n points in x counted with multiplicities, then uh, the Hilbert scheme resolves that by not just remembering um, the points and their multiplicity, but by considering some length n subscheme which has that support. So uh, this is a smooth Poisson variety. Um, and uh, for instance, if you take n equals two, so the Hilbert square, uh, this has a nice description. It's given by taking the symmetric square and blowing it up along the diagonal embedding of X. So this has uh, two pieces. Um, uh, there's the part which is the symmetric square remove the diagonal. So that's unchanged by the blow up. And that parameterizes the reduced schemes of length two. So that's just a pair of distinct points in the surface. 
not equal to one another. And then uh, there's the exceptional divisor of the blow up and it corresponds to length two schemes which are supported at a single point. So those exactly look like um, a choice of a point together with some tangent ray which is sticking out of it. So that's parameterized by the projectivization of the tangent bubble. Um, now, uh, in the particular case, when X is a compact Kähler manifold and the holomorphic Poisson structure is non-degenerate, these have been uh, very well studied. Um, so first of all, uh, if X is compact Kähler and pi is non-degenerate, then those same facts are true for the Hilbert scheme. Uh, this was observed by Beauville and Mukai. And so in other words, this uh, Hilb N is a, is a holomorphic symplectic manifold, which is Kähler. And so as a consequence of Yao's solution of the Calabi conjecture, these, uh, these manifolds carry hyperkähler metrics. And uh, well, these, uh, these are also essentially what's known as an irreducible holomorphic symplectic manifold. So um, they can't be expressed as products of uh, holomorphic symplectic manifolds of smaller dimension. Uh, there's a slight caveat here, um, which is that if X is a torus, then you need to take a fiber of a, of uh, the addition map to the torus, uh, which is the so-called Albanese map. Um, in any case, these, uh, these give these so-called irreducible holomorphic symplectic manifolds, uh, which are important in the classification of, of uh, varieties and particular study of compact hyperkähler manifolds. And amazingly, um, despite lots and lots of study, there are only two other known examples of these uh, irreducible manifolds, which are O'Grady's sixfold and tenfold. Um, so in a certain sense, these Hilbert schemes cover a, a, a large part of the landscape of known uh, compact hyperkähler manifolds. Uh, and for us, uh, maybe a comment on the deformation theory. So um, the deformations are unobstructed because this is a symplectic manifold and they're parameterized simply by deforming the cohomology class of the symplectic form. So it's just uh, H2 of this, uh, this variety. Okay, so uh, I want to now consider the case when the Poisson structure on the surface is degenerate. Uh, so let me explain what the symplectic leaves look like. So um, let me take a point in the Hilbert scheme. Remember that W is a point in this space, but it corresponds to uh, a subscheme in the original surface X. And so uh, it's a, a subscheme in X, and I can intersect it with this curve where the Poisson tensor on X vanishes. Okay, I do this in the scheme theoretic sense. So I take the local defining equations for W and the local defining equation for the curve and I impose them both and I get a subscheme of the surface, which I'm going to denote by boundary W. Uh, so the statement then is that two of, these, uh, two of these points in the Hilbert scheme lie in the same symplectic leaf of the Hilbert scheme if and only if their intersection with this uh, curve is the same as a scheme. So let me give some examples of what this looks like. So the simplest case to consider is when uh, the intersection of this subscheme with, uh, with the curve is empty. So in other words, what I'm saying is that I have n points in this, uh, in this surface and none of them can lie on this curve. The intersection with the curve is empty. So the picture is something like this. And so um, all we're looking at then is collections of points moving in the complement of the curve. So that's exactly the Hilbert scheme of the punctured uh, curve, which you get removed, uh, sorry, punctured surface, which you get by removing the curve. So that's a symplectic uh, space. And then at the opposite extreme, you can consider the case when uh, the intersection of W with the curve is actually all of W. So in other words, all the points in W lie on the curve. So something like this. And then um, the Poisson structure there has to vanish identically because the Poisson structure on the surface vanishes identically at all those points. And so the symplectic leaf through that point is actually just this single point itself. It's an isolated, it's a symplectic leaf of its own. It's a zero dimensional. And then, so somewhere in between these, we could consider the case where um, the intersection with the curve consists of n minus one points. So I have n minus one points on the curve and one of them is not on the curve. So at first glance, it looks like this should be parameterized by uh, the complement of the curve. But this is ignoring one important issue, which is that you have these fat points. So if you take a fat point, which is uh, supported 
at one of the other points, which is labeled, then um, what you get is a subscheme here, uh, which may have the same intersection. So, so if you have a vector which is sticking out transverse to the curve, then when you intersect this uh, length two subscheme with the curve, you'll actually just get a point with multiplicity one. So the tangent vector gets killed. So you have to remember these extra tangent vectors. And the, what ends up happening is that the symplectic leaf is given by blowing up the surface at all the labeled points, boundary W, and then taking the open symplectic leaf in this blown up surface. So in this way, by looking at the Hilbert schemes, you actually realize all the blowups of the surface as well. Okay, so let me explain uh, then what these characteristic symplectic leaves look like. Well, um, this is a question of what's going on with the modular vector field. Well, you can see that the modular vector field on the surface is a symmetry, so it has to lift to a corresponding symmetry of the Hilbert scheme, and that's exactly the modular vector field of the Hilbert scheme. So the proposition is that uh, the leaf in the Hilbert scheme through some, uh, some point W is characteristic. So the modular vector field is tangent, if and only if the intersection, this boundary W, which is a subscheme of the curve, is fixed by uh, the action of the modular vector field. So it's quite a concrete thing, which you could you know, write down an ideal and write down the modular vector field and just compute whether it's fixed or not. Uh, so the conjecture then, um, this is a work in progress, we haven't pinned everything down, uh, but the conjecture is that the Hilbert scheme is holonomic if and only if the number of characteristic leaves is infinite. We, we claim that that's supposed to happen always, uh, not just for Hilbert schemes. Uh, but then in the particular case of the Hilbert scheme, you might try to characterize that in terms of the original surface. And the characterization that we're expecting is that uh, the Hilbert scheme is holonomic for n bigger than two, ben bigger than or equal to two, if and only if the singularities are of type AK. So they're locally defined by an equation x squared is y to the k plus one. So we've uh, proven several cases of the statement, both forward implications are known. Um, the backwards implications are both known if n is equal to two or, or if the curve is smooth. Um, and the second backwards implication is known for singularities of type A1 and A2 as well. Um, and the key point somehow is why these AK singularities are appearing is that they're exactly this type of curve singularities such that the linearization of the modular vector field is non-zero. So it has the possibility of rotating some uh, fat points and making sure that those uh, length two subschemes are not uh, preserved by the modular vector field. So then uh, that's already enough what I've said on the last slide to figure out what the deformations can look like. So uh, let's go back to the case where we have a surface with quasi homogeneous singularities. Um, then the second Poisson cohomology, which parameterizes the deformations can be computed. It looks very similar to the surface case. There's a component, which is the second cohomology of the open symplectic leaf in this manifold, which is the Hilbert scheme of the open surface. And then there's a contribution, which uh, looks exactly like for a surface, it's this uh, parameterizes the smoothings of the singularities. So um, there's a well-known formula for the cohomology of the Hilbert scheme due to Gotcha and Sergal. And uh, if you apply that formula in this case, then you can uh, group some piece of the second cohomology is just the second cohomology of the surface. So together that gives the, the Poisson cohomology of the surface itself. And then uh, there's another component, which is wedge two of the first cohomology. And uh, finally, there's a component which is uh, represented by the first churn class of the exceptional divisor. So these all have a deformation theoretic interpretation. If you deform the Poisson surface, then of course you deform its Hilbert scheme. Um, and then uh, using the Albanese map, you can construct uh, these, these kind of uh, deformations just by changing the two form. And the most interesting deformations are the ones which correspond to the exceptional divisor. And Hitchin explained in a beautiful paper that uh, those somehow correspond to taking the Poisson surface, quantizing it to get a non-commutative surface and looking at the Hilbert scheme of that non-commutative surface. So these have been studied in some detail by Nevin Safford for P2 and Raines more generally. So anyway, a couple of corollaries of this, uh, this theorem. The first one is that uh, if the curve is smooth, this was observed already by Rand, then the deformations are necessarily unobstructed and parameterized by the second cohomology of the complement. Uh, and a second corollary, uh, which you just get by specializing to some example, uh, 
is that, uh, so if you take now X to be a rational surface, then uh, this uh, second piece of the deformation space is actually zero. Um, and so what you get is that uh, these Hilbert schemes of Reins, which parameterize uh, some kind of ideal sheaves on non-commutative rational surfaces, uh, those form a family of, of complex Poisson varieties and those sweep out an irreducible component of the moduli space. Okay, so um, I think I'm out of time. So I had one more slide on uh, sketching the proof, but maybe let me just say quickly that it's, uh, it's similar in spirit to what we did for a surface. So you, you make these uh, restrictions where you look at the contributions from certain strata and you, and you argue that uh, the only contributions come from, from these two types. All right, thanks very much for your attention.